Hello. Right, so we've got another talk now by uh, Emanuela Roca uh, about uh, ThinkPad X13S. So good morning, everyone. Very nice to be here with you all. Um, this talk, as you, as you know, is going to be about the ThinkPad X13S, which is this beautiful laptop over here. Ta -da. Not using it to show you the slides, even though I could have, because um, uh, we're still figuring out a few things, and this is what the, the talk is all about. You will see all the details about what, what is still missing and what is, uh, what is there. Uh, just a little note, I, was, uh, I became a Debian developer in 2003 in November, so this is my 20th Debian birthday. I'm very proud about that, and I'm happy to celebrate with you. So let's start. Uh, as mentioned, the talk is going to be about uh, essentially getting Debian to work fine on these uh, beautiful ARM machines. Uh, and how to do that? It's basically switching on kernel modules in the kernel configuration. Uh, of course, there's going to be a little bit more about it, otherwise the talk would be very short. Um, we're going to see essentially what the current status is, uh, how you do enable kernel modules in Debian, and then uh, how to get from a kernel package with all the right modules to... Uh, something that allows you to install the OS on the laptop. So, for example, the Debian installer, if you want to use the Debian installer, which is likely something you want to do, uh, or, but also for uh, live images. So Debian has uh, live images, as I'm sure you're aware, and they are built in a completely different way compared to the installer. Uh, so we will see also how to do that. Additionally, the Debian installer, uh, as, you know, as a software project, uh, has a bunch of artifacts, and these artifacts are then used to build uh, CD images like NetInst or bigger images or DVDs and so on. And so we will see a little bit how to do that as well. Uh, you could say that this talk is mostly about documenting what I've learned uh, in order to try to get Debian to work on the X13S, and I hope you will find that interesting. Uh, at the end, we'll also see what the next steps are, so what we're going to do next uh, in order to get this laptop to work even better. Current status. Uh, I'm going to start with the bad news. The, there are a few things that don't work. One thing that didn't work till yesterday was sound. So very up there, uh, the slides used to say sound, but as of yesterday, sound works, so that's done. Uh, EFI variables are not currently supported uh, in the sense that you can... Um, so th there are two kernel modules in order to get uh, EFI variables to work on this laptop. Um, and they, they are in the Linux Next uh, uh, branch, but they're not available in any Debian kernel yet or any uh, released kernel. So whenever those will be actually in a production kernel uh, that we will release, we will be able to have EFI variables, which is going to be great because it will allow us to uh, install Debian without a few workarounds that I will, I will show you later. Uh, other than that, there are a few uh, changes that are not dependent on kernel um, kernel modifications, but rather firmware changes. The, the laptop has a firmware, and this firmware enables certain sort of features. Um, what we're still waiting on uh, in order to have those features is basically firmware changes to get virtualization to work, secure boot, and pointer authentication. We just got to talk about pointer authentication, and that's uh, currently not working on the uh, X13S. Good news is that pretty much every, everything else works. Uh, the display works, the disk works, uh, trackpad touchpoint, all that. Um, as of yesterday, sound also works. And you can also run 32-bit code, uh, which is not something you can do on all ARM CPUs, ARM64 CPUs. Uh, on the X13S, you can. So you can have a, a shroot with ARM HF or ARML and run the code at native speed, which is pretty cool. Um, right, so... What do you have to do? Uh, can you just fetch an ISO and, and install Debian as normal as you would do on any other sort of laptop? Almost. Uh, we have done quite some work in order to ensure that you, know, you need to do as li uh, not much manual work, essentially. Um, what you have to do right now is getting the uh, daily ARM64 NetInst ISO from the Debian installer team, the official one. Uh, you boot with uh, this kernel parameter, which now should be familiar after uh, Steve's talk. So you have to disable pointer authentication by booting the kernel with no POs. Um, 
at one point, towards the end, the Debian installer will ask you, do you want me to force Grub to be installed in the EFI removable media path? You will have to answer yes to that question. Again, because EFI variables are not supported, so basically we cannot set an EFI variable telling uh, Grub, no, telling actually the firmware where to look for the bootloader. Um, so you will have to just answer yes to that question for now. Um, and finally, just at the very last thing before rebooting at the end of the I, you will have to do this thing. You will have basically enable a certain module uh, that you can see there on the slides uh, in initramfs tools, and then update the initramfs. We'll see how you can automate that, so you can do that with preceding instead of having to manually open a console and, and run this command. And we will also see why you have to do this. There's a wiki page uh, with the, all the details about basically what this slide says and, and quite a few more things if you're interested. Okay, um, now going to the, the, in the, the details of what the work done to get there. Uh, enabling kernel modules, building Debian installer images, and building live images is mostly uh, what we've been doing. Let's see them all. How do you enable kernel modules? This is a partial list of the modules that we had to enable. Uh, quite a few, as you can see. And not all of these modules are uh, immediately needed in order to boot the machine, obviously. So we'll see uh, which of those modules uh, are enabled at which stage of the uh, installation process. Uh, before that, though, we have to enable the kernel module. So we need to get the kernel source, uh, which is on Salsa, as I'm sure most of you know. Uh, after you clone that repo, you have to choose the appropriate branch. Uh, the kernel team has multiple branches because, of course, we have kernels for uh, different distros. We have seed bookworm. Uh, or we also have a master branch, which is uh, mostly where the stuff that goes to experimental is, but not really always. Um, so, yeah, depending on uh, which, uh, you know, which, uh, whether you want to basically install seed or, or anything else, you, you will have to check out the appropriate branch. Uh, the, the kernel project uh, on, on Salsa has only the Debian directory, so there's no kernel source actually there. And in order to fetch that, there is a script, uh, genorig.py, and this script gets uh, a parameter. This parameter is the kernel URL of the upstream kernel you want to get. The, um, if you want to build a stable kernel, that's the URL you need to use. That's the uh, stable kernel URL. If you want to use an RC kernel for whatever reason, then you will need to use the Torvalds uh, URL instead. Now, once that is done, there's a nice file which lists all the modules enabled. So you just have to edit that one. Uh, if you're lucky enough and the setting was already there and set to M, of course, you can set it to M or Y and you're done. If it's not there, you can just randomly add the setting wherever you like. It took me a while to figure this out. I was trying to understand what was the logic behind which module is listed where. And then I realized that you don't have to care. You don't have to care because there is a script doing that for you. Uh, system program detected. Yes. Excellent. We're not going to report that. Uh, right. So there's another um, project by the kernel team with uh, a bunch of, uh, of scripts, one of which um, is kconfig editor 2. And kconfig editor 2 allows you to basically uh, validate the various kconfig files in the source. And, uh, and also reorder options, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to put things in the right place for you. Okay. Once that is done, uh, there's a kernel handbook online with a ton of information about how to properly build a Debian kernel. Uh, this is the gist of what you actually need to do to just build a local kernel image for yourself for testing purposes. Um, the most interesting thing, I suppose, is that the uh, kernel, the Debian kernel supports different build profiles, so you can choose uh, to skip a few things that take quite a lot of time to build, um, one of which is the debug symbols, uh, but also the tools. So you probably don't want to rebuild perf if you just want to test a kernel to, to, to enable your hardware. Uh, also, the documentation is nice to have, but you don't have to rebuild that and wait for, for, for that to be built. Uh, once you've set this variable, you can then uh, run a few commands to generate the uh, orange tarball because uh, with the previous script that we've seen before, you fetch the, the kernel source, and with this uh, Debian rules orig, you get the actual orig tarball for the kernel. Then uh, also the control file, so the Debian control file is generated by a script. 
because depending on a few things the, that, that you can customize, um, the Debian kernel source will then generate a bunch of different binary packages, and the name of these binary packages can change depending on a few things. So with gen control py, you regenerate Debian control. And then just as normal as you would build any other Debian package, you can build the kernel with the package, build package. Uh, one thing I learned, which is pretty useful, is that you can change the, the name of the binary packages you're going to get. So as you know, you the, the, basically the, the version of the kernel that you're installing with a Debian package will have implication on the naming structure of, for example, your modules. So you're going to have lib modules and then a name and a number and a name. And uh, if you're testing things and you're building kernels a few times and then you want to install those and, and try things out, it's useful to distinguish between your test version and whatever is actually in SID. And you can do this by, for example, I'm sure there's some other way, but what I've learned is that you can set a custom ABI name. And you do that by editing a file under Debian config local defines. Uh, you set whatever string you like. And then you run gen control py again. That's going to regenerate Debian control. And it will then, you know, when you run the package build package, you'll get uh, binary uh, images with your string in there which is quite useful when you run uname or when you look at kernel modules on your file system. Okay, so at this point, we've chosen whatever modules we want to build. Uh, we rebuilt our kernel. We have kernel images that we can install on an ARM64 machine in this case, uh, but we cannot install anything because we don't have a Debian installer image with that kernel on. How do we get that? Um, so... In a way, I'm sure a lot of people will disagree maybe with this, but the, the Debian installer is an init RAM disk, essentially, with some special packages called UDEPs, but the, the, the crux of what starts at the very beginning is an init, well, kernel and an init RAM disk. Uh, so choosing which kernel modules go into the initial init RAM disk is pretty important to get your screen to work, which is probably useful, um, and many other things. Uh, so then the UDEPs later on will do things like configuring Grub or do a lot of other things that you need to install Debian. Uh, but they some of UDEPs also include kernel modules. So we created, we rebuilt a, a kernel with a bunch of modules. We've seen the slide with all the modules we needed to, to build. And then some of those will be needed in the initial initram disk and some others will be loaded later on in the installation process. And they will be uh, installed, as it were, by installing some special UDEPs. Uh, you can see the name of a few of those there. And, um, but these UDEPs can only be installed once you have some sort of working system. You need a display, you need a keyboard, you need, uh, if you're booting from the network, you need a network card and so forth. So the question now is which UDEPs should be shipping the modules that we have built? This takes a while to figure out. It's a bit of a trial and error process. Um, there's, in the kernel source, there are uh, files that are mapping basically names of uh, UDEBs with uh, the list of modules that we'll get into that UDEB. Uh, kernel image is perhaps the most important one is the uh, file that contains the list of kernel modules that will go in the initial RAM disk. And then you have a bunch of others. You could technically, I suppose, just put all of your modules in kernel image and be sure that everything works, but that wouldn't be particularly good in terms of minimalism. You will have a bigger initial init RAM disk and so forth. Um, this system ki is kind of pretty neat, actually. You have uh, support for inheritance, so you can have modules that maybe are used by different architectures, and those are defined in a more global directory. And then uh, for ARM64, uh, AMD64, or whatnot, you can specialize that definition and add more stuff. Um, right. Now, there's one distinction in terms of uh, Debian installer images that I wasn't aware about, uh, of, and it's pretty important. That's the distinction between netboot images and netinst images. Uh, so the easiest way to get an ISO that boots the Debian installer is uh, not actually to create a CD, a full-fledged Debian CD, but rather, uh, from the installer sources, we will see how you can have, like, there's a make target to create a mini ISO. Now, uh, this ISO, which is called the netboot image, uh, is pretty nice, and uh, I did manage to get all the modules I needed to, 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 to get, or I thought I, I needed to have, and, and I booted that, and everything worked. 
I was very happy. So I thought, okay, I found out the exact series of modules I need and the place where I need to put them. But then, as soon as I tried the NetInst image, the screen didn't work. This was pretty surprising because the NetInst image is bigger. So I thought, you know, it probably has more stuff. How is it possible that the smaller image does work and this one doesn't? Turns out that the um, initram disk of the smaller image, namely the netboot I image, is much bigger, it's double the size actually, of the NetInst image. And this is because the uh, NetInst image, or the bigger ones, the CDs, DVDs, and so forth, can load UDEBs from the media, right? So you don't need, for example, network support on that in the initial initram disk, right? You can just boot the kernel as long as the kernel manages to see the pen drive that you have in, then that file system will get mounted and you will be able to install kernel module or the DI will do it for you uh, to install the kernel modules from the USB stick. Uh, whereas if you're, if you're not booting, you cannot do that. You don't have that luxury because there is no media really, actually. Uh, you're just booting an image that uh, is going to do net boot. So it will fetch all the components from the network. Um, yeah. So basically the um, one of the UDEPs that is populating the initram disk of the netboot uh, image is called NIC wireless modules. It includes, as you can imagine, all the network interfaces you may uh, need uh, for Wi-Fi and, and also there's obviously a UDEP for other cards. Uh, right, so, and then the mystery still stands though because uh, the display shouldn't have too much to do with this. So what was happening then? We will see that, we will find that mystery. So um, we have seen how to build a kernel. We haven't seen the installer yet at all. Uh, in order to build a custom Debian installer image, you have to fetch the sources of the Debian installer. And then there are a few files that tell you um, which UDEPs go into which image. Right? So before we were mapping kernel modules to UDEPs, and now we're mapping UDEPs to installer images. Um, the netboot image includes network interface cards, as mentioned before, uh, whereas the other images include ISOFS, CD-ROM, and so on. It turns out that the uh, module that I needed for the display was somehow connected as a dependency of the uh, network interface card. So by having the network interface card, I was getting the uh, display to work. So the solution, as you can see in that merge request, was explicitly adding the necessary module to the unit RD, and that was it. So it was working by accident, but I was happy anyways. OK, so how do we build the ISO? Um, we have built a kernel before with the package build package. Uh, now we want to get a lot of UDEPs. That would be really nice. Um, in order to do that, you need to run a script from the kernel team to do the Debian test sign. This is actually building a Debian kernel is a two-step process. There is one initial stage, which is what we've seen before, which just creates the uh, kernel image packages you can install yourself. But then all the you, there is a signing uh, process, which also eventually then creates the uh, UDEVs and a lot of other packages. Given that we don't have the Debian key and we're not going to sign an official kernel with, with that key, we're going to need to use uh, another script, which is for test signing kernels. Uh, you can use that script against the changes file, and then you will get a DSC, and then you can build that with uh, SBUILD and, and get all the UDEVs you need. Uh, you will need to pass extra packages to build uh, with the current directory so that it finds all the dependencies, which are the uh, devs we've built previously. Uh, after a while, you'll get all the UDEBs, and then you can copy them to uh, a directory called local UDEBs in the Debian installer sources. And this way, you can override what the Debian installer will use as UDEBs for the image. Um, there are, there's a make target for a build netboot. So with this target, we get a mini ISO, which is the initial one I was mentioning before. This one, the one above, the, the smaller but bigger one. So the smaller one, but with a larger image from disk. And that's it. You have an ISO that you can copy on your USB stick and put the installer with your custom kernel, which is pretty cool. OK. Uh, pretty soon, if you do this sort of testing, you find out that it would be nice to customize a lot of things. You would like to. Uh, for example, be able to set custom kernel arguments to the command line so that you don't have to type them all the time. 
And in general, uh, you may want to do whatever customization you want. For example, you could have a pre-seed file. We will see the details later. Um, that's not too easy to do, though, because the ISO format that the uh, process, the, the, the build process uh, creates, is read-only. ISO, is read, ISO images are read-only. So um, you cannot really customize much. What you can do, however, uh, if you're booting an EFI system, which is probably the case often nowadays, uh, you can just create a FAT32 file system on a normal USB stick, and then you mount the uh, ISO locally on your machine, then you rsync stuff to the USB stick, and now that device is writable, so you can write whatever you like, and, and you're happy. Uh, what are the things you can customize? Why would you want to do that? There are a ton of things you can customize in the installer. Uh, for example, you may want to test a different Grub version compared to what is on the installer. It's really simple to do. You just have to replace the EFI file with Grub on the stick, and that's done. Uh, maybe you're testing a different shim version. You can do that as well. Uh, you may want to change the Grub configuration, for example, because you want to add ARM64 not POS to the uh, command line arguments, or you want bigger fonts or whatever case may be. Uh, a really useful feature of Debian installer is preceding, which is uh, essentially the idea of automatically answering the questions that DI asks you, which is very cool. You can do fully automated or partially automated installations. And to do that, um, you can, well, you, you need some sort of reference which uh, lists, you know, how to answer the questions. And Steve kindly provides such reference. There is a beautiful website uh, by Steve McIntyre with the list of all possible um, questions for all different uh, Debian uh, distros. You have uh, Bookworm, uh, Sid, whatever, Trixie. And then um, based on that, you can create a preseed.cfg file. You put it on the USB stick, and then uh, you add to the kernel uh, command line preseed file equals the path to the file, and that's it. Uh, all the questions will be automatically answered for you. More than that, more than just answering questions, you can also run commands, which is pretty nice. Uh, as you recall from the previous slide, there is a magic command we have to run at the very end in order to include a module in the final initram disk that the installed system will have. In order to type that command, you can add it to, uh, to the preceed file uh, with the preceed late command option. And uh, in target, we'll run the command in the installed system rather than on the DI uh, uh, system running um, the installer, and yeah, so you can you can automate multiple things by by doing this. Okay, so we've seen how to build a kernel with custom modules. We've seen how to create a Debian installer image uh, with such kernel. What if we want to build uh, full-fledged Debian CDs or live images with our customizations? So building an actual uh, CD image is not difficult, but it's it takes some time. Uh, the reason why it takes some time, there may be easier ways, please let me know if there are, <laughs> uh, is that you need a full mirror of the Debian archive. Uh, even if you're just building a netinst image, which is fairly small, in order to build that, you need uh, a full mirror, which takes a little bit to, to, to obtain. Um, so you will recall from the previous slides that in order to uh, create a netboot image, there was a make target in the Debian installer source. Uh, there's a slightly different target for uh, the rune you need for the CD-ROM, so for the full-fledged images. Uh, you run make, build, CD-ROM, grab, uh, and then you, um, it will do things, and instead of getting a mini ISO, you will get things that are going to be used later on. Once you do that, you create a mirror of the archive. You could possibly not really mirror the whole archive. There seem to be certain packages you can skip, I managed to get away with uh, not getting debug packages and GCC, which is quite a lot of stuff, actually. There are a ton of GCC binaries. Uh, I tried to get a bit too smart, and I was uh, excluding packages that I thought surely are not going to be needed. They were needed. So I probably spent more time trying to exclude things than I would have by just downloaded ev downloading everything. Um, anyways, once you have a uh, uh, mirror of the archive, you... Uh, you get the source of uh, the Debian CD package, so apt get source Debian CD. You install all the dependencies. Uh, and then there are a few steps needed uh, at this point for building your own uh, CD image. First of all, there's a patch that you need to get uh, to, to allow unsigned repos, because we're going to add uh, Debian packages from our local machine, so they're not going to come from signed official 
Debian repos. Um, there also seems to be a need to pass a law in secure repositories through somewhere in the script, um, but I haven't really tested this too, too much. Like, I've managed to get it to work once. Uh, uh, it's probably worth spending more time on this to, to get it to work uh, in an easier way for people who want to build their own images. Uh, there are two files you need to edit at that point. One is called conf sh, and you have to specify the directory to your own local devs. If you're building a custom Debian CD, you probably have some custom uh, packages you want to you want to install, and we do, because one of those packages is the kernel. Um, EasyBuild.sh uh, will need uh, the path to your Debian installer directory, so wherever you fetch the DI uh, source need to be uh, referenced there. A few other variables, but that's fairly well documented in the script. And then, uh, yeah, and then you can run EasyBuild.sh with either the CD argument or netinst, uh, and, and you will get the ISO after a bit, the ISO. Okay, so that's a standard regular Debian CD. Uh, there are live images as well, which are pretty cool. You can boot a live system uh, from a USB stick, or you can also uh, install, as it were, because the, the Calamaris installer is in the live images, so you can uh, actually then install the system directly from there. Uh, this is fully unrelated to Debian installer. The, the live team is maintaining these images. Um, currently, there is no live image auto-built officially for ARM64, the reason is that the images are not uh, reproducible. The images that are built, because they are cross-built, there is a AMD64 machine building the official images. It's building live uh, images for AMD64, of course. Uh, it would have to cross-build the ARM64 images, and that process is not reproducible. Uh, there's some work ongoing in order to fix that. So essentially, if you want to use a live image on an ARM64 machine, you have to build your own image. Uh, and it's very easy to do. Uh, you install the package live build, then there's a command to uh, configure the image, and then you type lb build, and you get the functioning ISO. This is if you don't want to customize anything at all, right? You just want to maybe pass certain uh, areas of the archive or maybe change the distro, but that's pretty much it. Just two commands, and, and you get the ISO, but you cannot customize it. If you want to customize it, there's a little bit more work to do. Uh, for example, we, one thing we wanted to do was passing kernel arguments. Uh, you can call lbconfig with an argument called boot up and live, and that will then add the um, parameters you pass to the kernel command line of the final live ISO. Uh, we also need a custom init RAM disk. We need to include quite a few modules, uh, as mentioned before, that are needed for the uh, X13S in this case, or whatever the hardware you want to enable is. Uh, in order to do that, you need to put them in a, uh, in a file that is created by uh, lbconfig, or rather, there's a directory called config includes chroot after packages. In there, you can specify the absolute path of the file you, you want to have in the image. Uh, other than that, you can choose which uh, desktop environment you want in the live image. By default, I think it's GNOME, but you can use LXD, X, uh, Xface, whatever you want. If you have any custom packages, for example, our kernel, you just drop them under config packages.root and they will end up in the final image. Okay. Um, what are the next steps for the X13S? What are the things we, we want to enable at this point? Uh, so on the left, we'll see what is the step that we want to, to take and what can we then stop doing? What is the annoying thing we won't have to do anymore then? Uh, once we get a firmware that uh, fixes pointer authentication, then we can stop booting with ORM. Uh, no auth, of course. Uh, there is a way to actually properly specify dependencies between kernel modules, uh, and that's using soft dep. So we could do that, uh, and then we will stop having to specify the list of kernel modules we need uh, in the initramfs. Uh, finally, as mentioned earlier, there are two modules that. Uh, will allow us to have EFI variable supports. Once those modules are in, then we won't have to uh, tell the installer to put grub in the EFI removable path because we'll have full EFI variable support. Okay? So to conclude, 
You can use Debian on the ThinkPad X13S. Some of you have seen me using it in the last days, and now there's also sound. <laughs> uh, enabling new hardware is a process that is definitely iterative. Uh, it takes a while to start from you know, like a non-working system at all and then slowly adding, adding pieces. Uh, the Debian installer is pretty cool if you look at it. Uh, the, the, it's, it's a very nice system. It's quite minimal, and it's easy to understand what it does to a certain extent. Uh, not saying it's perfect, but it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, yeah, and hopefully we're going to get live images for ARM64 as well soon. That's it. Thank you. Any questions or comments? That's really nice to see. Um, it'd be awesome. I mean, a few of us were w trying to get an ARM64 laptop set up working, God, what, a decade ago or something? Um, and I'm glad to see that, yeah, we, we're almost there. Yes. You know. um, for bits and pieces where you have th tweaks to DI or Debian CD or whatever, please prod me and, you know, I'll make it easier and... and take patches. Sounds good. So what's next? Um, there's a few bits and pieces of hardware that aren't quite the um, are we expecting to get everything fully supported? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I hope so. I think mostly the, uh, uh, the parts that are in our hands, yes. Uh, some, some things uh, will be dependent on firmware uh, updates, so I cannot promise much on those. Uh, yeah. the, the, uh, in the very specific case of the ThinkPad X13S, I think the, the machine is pretty cool, and as you said, it's really, really nice to get an ARM machine that works uh, to a certain extent, which is good. Uh, yeah, unfortunately for those pieces that are uh, in the control of essentially Lenovo, I'm, I'm not really sure when and how. I assume, have you been talking to Mark at Lenovo about this? A little bit, yeah. Okay. I know he'll be over the moon to, to, to see this. So thank you very much. Thank you. I was very briefly just going to ask about virtualization and secure boot because you mentioned them not working but then didn't mention them in the next steps. I'm right. guessing those are things that you need Lenovo. Right? Yeah, so I think in the next steps, what I said is uh, maybe, f so for virtualization secure boot, uh, you're right, they're not mentioned in the next steps at all. Um, the, uh, currently, the way the, the firmware works is that the, uh, um, the exception level that the machine is booting into is the one that you would need actually to run VMs. Uh, so the base OS, like the hypervisor, if you're aware, uh, is running at that level, so you cannot create VMs. Whenever there's going to be a change in the firmware to support that, then we will be able to. Uh, and secure boot also, so uh, I really have to talk with Mark about this. Um, I know that there are different, uh, there are a few things you need to enable in essentially the Lenovo firmware in order to enable secure boot. And, um, and those pieces are not there on the X13S for Linux. Uh, Steve maybe knows more, though. Yeah, so specifically with Secure Boot, it's the third-party CA stuff that's not there right. in the menu. You might be able to do something clever with key enrollment, but I don't know it well enough. But that's the bit that's missing, and we, we've flagged it, so it's known. At the moment, you uh, really cannot because of EFI variable support, which is missing. Uh, so you cannot put your own keys anywhere because there's no variable to store them. Uh, maybe once that's done, we can try with custom keys and, and see if that works. But for proper support, yeah, pending. Yeah, yeah so um, I assume most of this work is happening on, on Debian Seed. Um, mm, would it be possible to get all of this into the bookworm kernel and bookworm systems? And do you have any ideas for how to mm, lower the gap from time to market to time to Debian? 
Right. So uh, the kernel can be backported, of course. There are already backports of the kernel. Uh, I don't think we do backported installer images, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, so you, you could, conceivably, you could have your own custom image that you create with, you know, which installs Bookworm and, uh, and uses the kernel from backports. You could do that. Uh, I, I really don't know whether it's ever, yeah, maybe Steve knows better. I have, I've never seen backported installer images, essentially, which would be but probably the easiest way. These to modules do are not being backported into the 6.1 kernel that's in book one. All right, no, you would have, yeah, so you would have to, uh, no, you're right, you would have to rebuild a custom kernel, actually, yes. Okay. You, it depends. So if the module, in certain cases, it could be that the module is available in 6.1, yeah. and then it's just a matter of enabling it, and then we can ask the kernel team to, you know, book, uh, backport that. Um, but in the specific case of the X13S, most of these modules are 6.5, 6.6, and some 6.7. So, yeah, no. for, for that specific hardware, no. For the general topic of hardware enablement in Debian, if the module is in 6.1, for example, but it's just not enabled, we could enable it and then backport the kernel. Yeah, we have done some work in DI and Debian CD on doing... Um, images including backports kernel and other bits of backported stuff it's just it's it's there's a big stack of patches it's just a case of we'll get there maybe eventually um, but if somebody wants to help work on that that will be a lovely place to get involved you mentioned adding a module to the init rd right did I miss something, or did you ever actually tell us what that module was for? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very tricky question, actually, this one, because there, there are a few modules. There's, um, uh, there's an interconnect, which, of course, like, is a very important part which connects with various pieces of the SOC, and that one is clear. Uh, you will need to have that one in the middle to put all the pieces in between. Uh, I, I'm not super sure about what each and every individual module does, so I don't know about that one. But also... Um, adding one module to the init RAM disk and then ending up with a working system may mean that some of the dependencies of that module were also needed, and by adding that, you fix things. So I cannot tell you for sure what was the missing piece, no. Uh, you mentioned a couple of rough edges about getting new devs into your mini ISOs and things like that. Uh, I've got an add-on to the Salsa CI called Branch to Repo that we use for building new devs on Salsa, oh. which does all of that using signed repos automatically and doesn't use local new devs. Very it nice. doesn't currently do anything with ARM because we haven't got the workers, but I think the, the combination of the two might be able to just get rid of some of the pain right. for you. So, so you mean should, the, the GitLab talk. runners are missing? Hmm? The GitLab runners are missing, you mean? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I haven't done anything with ARM, so okay. I can't say you can do it today, but right. um, basically there's overlapping bits, which should mean that most of the caveats that you have to worry about disappear. Because, wow. for instance, there's support for adding an extra repo in um, uh, the bootstrap. In, it's a disgusting patch, but it does work. Right. And so for testing, it's fine. It's not release quality. But if you're just saying I need to add a, a tweaked UDEB, then you can on AMD you can currently do the patch and uh, Salsa will build everything all the way to uh, mini ISO without uh, doing anything horrible. So there are signed apt aptly repos getting created and things right. like that. That's very neat. Okay, so I can show you that later. Please. Okay. Any more questions? All right, thanks very much.